Um, I, uh, something just hit my little brain. Uh, you parents, look around and make sure you've got all your kids with you. Uh, two little boys got in trouble with me a while ago, and I told them to go to my office and stay there until some adult came to get them, and I forgot about it. <laughs> so make sure you've got all your kids. If you don't, they're in my office. I hope they've not remodeled my office. Um, and maybe usually if a parent looks around, they don't see their children, they know that they are, uh, they've been uh, locked up in my office. So uh, I hope you parents will just do an inventory real quick. Some of you go, no, mine are not all here and it's much quieter. I'm just going to wait till the end of service to go get them. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. We serve an awesome God. Amen. I hope you noticed this morning we've got some decorations. We're going to be having our Christmas program. Uh, I noticed uh, as I looked, Miss Rebecca was hiding behind the tree. Uh, and it reminded me of when I was in school, if I wasn't good, they'd make me stand in the corner. So I thought, well, Miss Rebecca must have been bad this week. And so they stood her behind the tree in the choir. Uh, Jeff nods his head. That's exactly what happened. I want you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number two, and uh, we're going to finish. Uh, I mentioned a few weeks ago that I was going to preach three messages on being grateful. Now, I know that Thanksgiving, as far as the day, has passed, but there is never a day that we should not express a spirit of gratefulness, a spirit of thankfulness to our Heavenly Father for all that He has done for us, the Bible says that He daily loadeth us with benefits. Um, we have so many promises in the Word of God uh, that should encourage us to have a spirit of gratitude every single day. And so I want to go ahead and preach uh, the third message and the last message in th that particular series. And I will read in Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse number 14. The Bible says, Do all things without murmurings. And disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Now, I want you to go all the way over to the book of Numbers, chapter 11. <clears throat> the book of Numbers, chapter 11. And we'll be coming back to the New Testament in just a few moments. In Numbers, chapter 11, the Bible, once again, talks about complaining and murmuring. How many of you that uh, are either presently or in the past have had the opportunity to raise children? Say amen. Didn't it just bless your heart when they complained and murmured and griped uh, when you knew that they were far more blessed than they deserved and yet they still had an attitude of murmuring and complaining and uh, just generally a, a, a attitude or a spirit of ungratefulness and how that you tried intently to correct that attitude. I know most of you parents would try to correct that attitude. Well, just let me say that God being our Heavenly Father, He looks down and He listens and He hears even His people, those who have been covered by the blood of Jesus, those who have been so immensely blessed, and He hears us murmuring or complaining and I believe that the Word of God is simply trying to correct us from that negative and sinful attitude. Now, the Bible says in Numbers chapter 11, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. Now, you guys are going to be sitting for a few moments, so just let me ask you this. Do you understand that when we murmur and complain, that murmuring and complaining is always against God first, and the Bible says that that displeases God? If you understand that, say amen. amen. It is not good for God's people to murmur and complain. It displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. I like that, that scripture. 
I've heard it said that our sin would be much less if our consequence was immediate. In that day, we, he heard their murmuring and complaining, and God dealt with it in a very, very harsh way immediately. The Bible says, And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of that place Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Now, notice verse 4 and 5, and then I'll let you uh, sit down here in just a moment. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Now, I'll let you sit down before I start preaching to you. But don't do it just yet. I've often wondered, what will it take? What would it take for people to learn that we should never, mur never murmur and complain against God? You might say, well, it would take something miraculous. It would take a mighty move of God in our very presence, and we would learn. The mixed multitude nor the people of Israel learned a single thing. They complained. God literally sent fire consumed a whole bunch of them, and the rest of them said, so now, who's going to feed us? We remember how good it was in Egypt when we were slaves, but at least we had something to eat, and now we don't have anything besides this manna. Manna that fell from heaven out of the hand of God and fed them, and they said, we don't have anything left except this old manna. Are you thankful? Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for the goodness and mercy that you extend to us every day. Lord, I thank you for salvation. Lord, the very fact that many of us today are saved, those of us who have put our faith and trust in you, Lord, those of us who have cried out to you in repentance and ask you to forgive us and to be the Lord of our lives, Lord, we have everything to be grateful for. So God, teach us today, encourage us today in your word, and we give you praise. And most of all, I pray that somebody might get saved today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And amen, you can be seated. I want to just give you a personal observation, if I may, in understanding that it's strictly a personal observation but I believe that history will one day record that our culture or our time in the big picture of time will be recognized as the most prosperous generation when you speak of material and monetary possessions. And you might say, what do you mean by that? Every time that I read history, or every time that I look at old, even family photographs, it reminds me of how little they had and how much we have. As I was looking at some old pictures uh, the other day, and, and uh, it showed my grandfather and my great-grandfather and a, a lot of my great-uncles, and uh, their transportation back then was primarily horses or wagons. And their, their uh, uh, area, I guess you could say, that they traveled in was probably a 50, 60 mile radius. If they went very far, it was a two day trip. As I was doing some reading, I found out that the first car that my grandparents had, it didn't have a heater in it. And so if they were going somewhere on a cold day, the night before, they would put bricks on the old wood stove and heat up the bricks, put the bricks in the floorboard of the car, cover them with a sheet or a towel, and that would be the heat that kept them warm as they traveled I look at those things and I realize in comparison what we have today, uh, 
compared to what they had back then. And yet it just seemed as I remember them, uh, of course they were much older, but I remember that they almost all had a spirit of gratefulness, a spirit of gratitude for what God had given to them. At their Thanksgiving dinners, it wasn't like our Thanksgiving dinners today. Uh, I mean, it was a deal where maybe all of them would have enough, but there was never too much. There was never something to throw away, if you will. I think about Christmas and even at my young age, I remember growing up, I know my brother remembers this, he's a lot older than me, so he can remember better, but uh, we didn't get, a, uh, we didn't get a truckload of, of gifts at Christmas time. I remember that our parents would let us pick out one gift, and we could look in a, maybe a Sears magazine or Western Auto or something like that, and uh, we could pick out one gift, and there was always a limit on what that may cost, and that's, that was one gift that we looked forward to, and that was all we got, and we took care of it because we were grateful that we had that one gift. If we told our children today, even running from age 25 down, if you said our Christmas is going to consist of you getting one gift, you've got a $25 limit, and you pick out the one gift, and that's all, that's all we're going to have. Some of you are already going, it would be absolute chaos at our house. It would. And yet, we have so much today, and I believe that having so much with so little responsibility has added to a spirit of ungratefulness, a spirit of ingratitude. Now, I'm not saying that I would like to go back to those times. I'm just simply saying that the Bible says that God daily loads us with benefits, and those benefits, though they be eternal, yet some of them are temporal blessings that God gives to us to enjoy in our very day, and we ought to be grateful for those things. Many people are seldom satisfied and it is a spirit of ungratefulness and a spirit of discontentment that seems to be the prevailing attitude in our country today. Now, I could give a lot of reasons for that. Um, I, I watch the news quite a bit, and uh, I'm amazed at some of the advertisements that we see. Now, I always pick on Brahms, okay? Um, listen, now, I want you all to get this. We think that advertisements are all just very simple and kind of funny, but they are designed to make you discontent. Are y'all following? They're designed to make you discontent. I mean, you have a nice vehicle, it gets you where you're going um, some of the time, and, uh, but they ever, you, you turn on the news and there's these shiny new vehicles and they are designed to make you feel like that you have to have one of those. And, and it works. Uh, it works. Uh, I've often mentioned the Brahms advertisement, and, I, and I'm, I'm not saying that I'm immune from that, but I hate to see a Brahms advertisement late at night. You know, because it's time for bed, you, you had your shower, you're ready for bed, and then Brahms comes on and advertises the Black Forest Sunday. And you know what? There are people, you, you just have to have it. You're not satisfied that you just had a big bowl of, of uh, chunky chocolate out of your own refrigerator. Now you've got to go to Brahms. We have an entire generation, maybe more, that live with such a spirit of ingratitude. And I just want to say this to you, that just as God saw that and heard that, in the book of Numbers, God sees that and he hears that today. I believe there's an answer to that and the answer comes in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to have a deeper, more intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in having that deeper, more intimate relationship with Christ, I believe that we would be able to see who he is and we would be able to realize what he has done for us. And so I want to encourage you this morning, if you are a child of God, that you would ask God for the grace to have that more, that deeper and that, that closer relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That thing that would cause you to wake up every morning and be grateful that you've had a good night's rest, to be grateful that you have clothes to wear and food to eat. Folks, listen, 
we are moving into the time that we call Christmas, and I'm grateful. Most of your Bible lessons this morning was uh, literally an effort to cause us to concentrate on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we concentrate on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, it should encourage us in such a way that murmuring and complaining would never be part of our lives, that we would always be grateful to God. Do you know that I deal with a lot of people, I used to wonder about it, and now I experience it. I used to deal with a lot of older people, and it seemed they had a hard time just looking forward with greatness, with gratitude. And I remember a number of people saying to me, uh, Preacher, listen, I'm so, and I'll just, I'm 67, so, Preacher, I'm 67 years old, and there's a whole lot more of my life already been lived than I have left. How many of y'all have thought about that? I think about it all the time. I mean, how many, how many more years do I have? If God, if God is extra good to me, I might have 10 years left, maybe 15 years left. So do I complain and murmur and fret and worry about what I may not have? Or can I stop and say, God, thank you for what you already have given to me? Thank you, God, for what you've already poured out on my life. Thank you, God, for the people that you've put in my life that, that have helped me and have encouraged me and influenced me. And then, God, thank you for giving me the opportunity maybe to have some kind of influence on someone else. It is a fact that I'll not live 67 more years. Wouldn't that be awful if y'all had to put it for 67 more years? I mean, my goodness. Now, if that happened, go ahead and complain a little. I'm all right with that. But pardon the English, but it ain't going to happen. But we ought to rejoice about what God has already given to us. I was excited the other day. Some of the men and I drove to the city and to visit with Brother Darrell. And uh, he had just got a report that maybe was not as good as some had hoped. And then uh, we know that he's got a better report now. But one of the things that really impressed me, and I see it all the time, many, many times with Christians... He said, Preacher, I'm not concerned about this. He had a smile on his face. He says, God's got it. Whatever it is, God has it. And God knows what's best. His ways are different. His, his thoughts are different than our thoughts. But God has it. What a spirit of gratefulness. Did you know that as the Apostle Paul there in the book of Philippians wrote to the Philippian church and he warned them about murmuring and complaining it becomes obvious, and what is implied there is that the church, you and I as believers, we are not immune from having a spirit of, of ingratitude, a spirit of ungratefulness, and the Apostle Paul dealt with that. Complaining is not new. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 12, when Adam and Eve had transgressed the law of God and the Lord came uh, walking in the coolness of the day and he asked them where they were, of course, you know, you know the story. And as they were confronted with what they had done, um, Adam made a complaint to, the, to God. And, and here's what he said. In chapter 3 and verse 12, he said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave it to me and I did eat it. Now, that was a pretty legitimate excuse. Matter of fact, it's repeated in the New Testament in a similar way. Did you know that in Luke chapter 14, the Bible talks about the man that prepared a great supper. And he told his servants, he said, go out, go out to the highways and the hedges and invite people to come to the great supper. He went to the first guy, he said, you're invited to the great supper. And the guy said, well, I'd come, but I bought a piece of land, and I, I, I got to tend to that. So he moves on to the next guy. He said, you're invited to the great supper. And the guy said, well, I'd love to come, but I bought five oxen, a yoke of oxen. I've got to go tend to those yoke of oxen. And he went to the third guy, and he said, you're invited to the great supper. And he said, well, I've, I've taken a wife. <laughs> Now, I, I, I'm not trying to add to Scripture, but if I could, he would probably say, and even if I wanted to come, we couldn't get there on time. I mean, now some of you ladies, some of you ladies, I know you're looking at me funny and you're going, boo. Now, don't murmur. 
I trapped y'all right into that. Did you see that? I trapped y'all right into that. Don't murmur. Be grateful that I directed you to that eternal scripture. But we are a people that we murmur. And yet we should be so grateful for what God has graciously done for us. Murmuring is not new. In Numbers chapter 13, when the spies went over, and you know the story, almost everybody is, is familiar with the story of the, when the spies came back, they all had a murmuring and complaining attitude. They said, God, we can't take the land. There's too many of the enemy and they're, they're giants and there's great fortified cities and we can't do it. It was a spirit of murmuring. murmuring. Rather than being grateful that God had given them a promise that they were going to possess that, they murmured and complained because of what they saw standing in the way. And yet God had already proven that he could remove all of the obstacles. But they had a spirit of murmuring. In Exodus chapter 14 and 15, many other places, you'll find that Israel complained about the water. They complained about the food. They complained about the leadership. They just complained and murmured. You see, in gratitude is seen today in many ways as an all-out attack on God's sovereignty and God's providential will in your life. I want to ask you this quick question. How many of you are saved this morning? Say amen. amen. Did you know that God is a sovereign God? He, he is a sovereign over my life and over your life. He's a sovereign God. And he has a, maybe for lack of a better, a providential will for us. God has things planned. He has a plan for your life as an individual. And rather than fret and worry and complain and murmur because maybe things are not unfolding the way you thought that they ought to uh, unfold or they should unfold, we should be grateful for the sovereignty of God and that he does have a specific will for your life and for mine. You see... In America, we are so discontented. We see it every day in many, many ways. We try to change things that God intended to be unchangeable. And all of that is a spirit of ingratitude. We see it in so many ways just as we walk down the street from day to day. I believe it's most prevalent right now in our nation in that now, if the sex that God made you does not please you, we just spit in the face of God and try to change it. What a spirit of ingratitude to God. What a spirit of ungratefulness. In the sovereignty and God's providential will for your life. So we should stop complaining. Now I want you to go back to Philippians to the short text that I read. And I'm going to give you there three, I believe, very obvious reasons why we need to stop complaining. Now, I, um, my dad would give us a lot of reasons to stop complaining as we grew up. Uh, I love to give personal illustration. I, I, I wish that we were yet back in that generation where parents thought it was important to teach their children basic things. But uh, the primary reason that we had growing up for not complaining is because there was immediate consequence for our complaining. There was immediate consequence. It was not acceptable uh, with my dad. My dad had a lot of faults. But complaining and murmuring and griping was not acceptable. And if we chose to do so, then we were choosing... Um, some correction. And I remember my dad saying, look, I didn't choose this, you did. Did you know that oftentimes when God chastens his children, first of all, if you, were, if you said you were saved a while ago, you're a child of God. Did you know that many times when God chastens his children in an act of love, that we blame the chastening on to God? We blame it on to God. I remember my dad making this statement. He said, look, if you, if there's a consequence for what you have done, then it's a consequence that you chose. 
Are y'all following me? And when God says, don't complain and don't murmur. When God says, rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. When God says, be thankful in all things. When we have those simple commands. So when we refuse to do what God says, and consequences come as a result of that, it's because we have chosen. Amen? I mean, don't blame it on to God. You had the choice. You had the choice. And so the consequence comes because we made the choice to have the consequence. Now, probably we were hoping that God wouldn't see it or that maybe he wouldn't remember, but he always did. I remember some of the worst punishment that we ever got growing up is when we did something that was not necessarily right. And uh, as we got older, you all know how small my mother is, but as we got older, she would say, when your dad gets home, I remember going to get in the paddle and say, Mom, go ahead. <laughs> Just go ahead. Don't make me wait. Are y'all follow? You're, okay. Now, I think about those things and how many times they have a, a spiritual application. So I want to I want to show you that in this passage, beginning there in verse number 14, I believe, in Philippians chapter 2. I want you to look at that where he says, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Now, that's a command. And then he said, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. Now, you may read that in a, maybe a different translation of the Bible, but I believe if you'll study the, right there in the King James, you'll see what that's talking about. It says that we are to be blameless and harmless to be a godly example to other believers. Guys, listen, when, when I profess to be a child of God, but out in the community I am known as a complainer and a murmurer, when I'm known as, as not being grateful, do you see how negative a, 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 a testimony that that puts out for Christ I'm supposed to be a child of God and I'm murmuring and complaining and carrying on like I'm not a child of God. So what Paul is saying to the Philippian believers there is that so you may be blameless and harmless. Do no harm to anyone. In other words, be a good testimony by your spirit of greatness, by your spirit of gratitude. Look in verse 15, the last part. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We need to not complain and murmur so that we'll, we'll be a light. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Did you know that there are lost people that may never get saved if they see you as the Christian and they also see you as the murmurer and the complainer and the one who is never, never satisfied. Guys, it's a serious matter, this issue of murmuring and complaining. You know, I, I get to interact a lot with people and it, it blesses my heart when I get to interact with some of our young people that, that I'm assuming that it's been taught them by their parents or their grandparents but they truly do have a spirit of gratefulness. It's encouraging to me. They're grateful for the, the job that they have, or they're grateful that they're being cared for like they are. They're grateful. I had a, a young lady the other day, a young girl. She was just expressing her gratefulness because her grandfather had provided her a vehicle when she got to be a certain age. And I tell you, it wasn't a brand new vehicle. It was one that he worked on to get going. But she was grateful for that. That is encouraging. Do you understand? Listen, there are people that may never come to know Christ. If they hear you profess Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life, and then you murmur and complain about everything that's going on. Folks, listen. I know how much gas costs. I try to keep my vehicles full. And it's very expensive. I bought a pickup a while back, a, a used pickup, I might add. And I didn't know how much fuel it held, Chet. And so I drove it around for a week or so, and I, it was getting low of fuel, so I pulled up to the store, uh, put the deal in, went inside, and about five minutes, and this thing is still running and still running. And I'm going, 
what is going on? I, I asked the lady, I said, is that diesel running out on the ground? And uh, she said, no, it's still running. That thing had a 55-gallon tank on it. It cost me two yearling calves to fill it up. Almost $4 a gallon. Can you believe that? I stuck my credit card in there. It wilted my credit card. <laughs> but you know what? And this actually happened. It was cold that night. I got in my vehicle and started down the road, and there was a guy riding a bicycle. Are y'all following me? Isn't it amazing how God will just kind of give you a little spanking? I said, Lord, I'm glad I've got a vehicle that'll hold 55 gallons of diesel. I mean, I can probably drive that thing for a week and never have to fill it up. Better than a bicycle. I had a nice warm jacket on. That fella had barely anything. Are you thankful? Are we grateful for what God has done for us? Are we grateful that God has promised provision? It's more about Jesus than anything else. Now I'm going to show you something in verse number 16. And I, I, know, the, I know that the Lord allowed the Apostle Paul to write this for pastors. Now, I want all y'all to listen up now. This is, this is my favorite verse of the text. He says, holding forth the word of life. Now, this is Paul speaking, but speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He said that I, Paul, may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Now, Paul was the pastor, and he said, don't murmur and complain, <clears throat> so that I may be able to rejoice and that my teaching of you has not been in vain. <clears throat> How many of you, growing up, you wanted to please your parent? Seriously, most all of us. And we appreciated when our parent would pat us on the back and praise us for something that we had done good. Now, <clears throat> Paul wrote this as a pastor, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. So, inasmuch as I'm the pastor, I want to make this very, very personal. He says, don't murmur and don't complain so that I can rejoice. So that I can rejoice. Paul made it very, very personal. And so I would simply say to you, based on that principle, that if you couldn't find any other reason to stop complaining and murmuring, stop complaining and murmuring so that I can rejoice. And so I can look back and say, my teaching, which is right out of the Word of God, is not in vain. That my preaching is not in vain. That's what Paul said. He said, I'm the pastor. Don't murmur and don't complain because I want to be able to rejoice in your testimony. I don't want to stop down at the local store and somebody say, yeah, one of your church members was in here a while ago just griping and complaining. Now that's personal. But Paul, by the, led by the Holy Spirit, put it in there so that we would understand that we do have we do have a great influence. We have great responsibility to one another as believers to rejoice, not complain, not murmur. It's getting very quiet in here right now. Some of you are going, that's too personal. But had y'all rather see me out in the community rejoicing or crying? Don't answer that. <laughs> I want to rejoice. I want to be able to be the rejoicing pastor because you've listened to the Word of God and you're, 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 you're grateful and you, your attitude is, God, thank you for this day.
Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, Be ye followers of me, as I am a follower of Christ. Do you know that whatever sin that you are in, And if it is a spirit of ingratitude, any other sin, the answer is definitely a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and a deeper and more personal relationship with Jesus. Did you know that Jesus said, I'm the light of the world? Do you know the closer you get to the light, the less darkness you have to deal with? Isn't it it true that as believers that our living in a dark world, can, it can become difficult for us. We live in a dark world. And especially if you're a child of God, and I want to be encouraging to you this morning, but I want to be realistic as well. If you're a child of God, the only way it's going to get better is if you pray that God would help you to deepen your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this world is not going to get better. And the closer we get to the light, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The closer that I can get to the light, to the Lord Jesus Christ, the less darkness that I will have to deal with. Because light overcomes darkness. So a deeper, closer, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ is ultimately the answer. Did you know that the more of the bread of life that we consume, the less of the dainties of this world that we'll desire? The more of the living water that I can enjoy, the less of the world's temporal I will desire. So in all of this, stop murmuring, stop complaining, rejoice evermore. It's all found in a deeper, more personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that was born in Bethlehem, lived a sinless life, willingly carried his cross to Calvary and died for you. When we think about that, it causes us to rejoice. It causes us to be grateful. It causes us to stop complaining and murmuring. But thank God for all that he has done for you and for me. Ungratefulness, unthankfulness, spirit of ingratitude, whatever one may call it. I believe that it is a result of a lack of faith in God's sovereignty and as I mentioned it again, His providential will for your life. It's not unusual, though it is sinful. It's not unusual for people to think that we have a better idea of what should happen in our lives than God has. It's it's not unusual for us to say, God, this is what I've got planned, and so, God, I'll be grateful when you bring my plan to pass, instead of trusting our lives to the providential will of God, to the sovereignty of God. You know, I've thought about this oftentimes, and I say this truly with a spirit of gratefulness. I remember when I first came to Lindsay Chapel 35 years ago, um, a lot of my preacher friends said, don't just kind of live out of your suitcase because nobody's ever stayed out there very long. So just kind of don't, just don't expect to stay very long. And God just left us. <laughs> now, did that sound odd? But there came a time when Miss Deb and I had to stop and realize that whatever plans we may have had even before ministry, before we were in the pastoral ministry, that whatever plans that we had should always take a back seat to God's will for my life. To God's personal will for my life. And when I can submit to that, to God's providential will for His sovereignty, for His, that perfect will that He has for my life and your life, when we can succumb to that, when we can, we can submit to that, then as he leads us from day to day, we'll be able to see the things that he wants us to see. And he didn't always want us to see everything right now. 
He reveals many things as we go on the way. But we can rejoice knowing that God is leading us and guiding us every step of the way. So we should be grateful. It is a command. But I want to be quick to say this, that I can stand before you and preach the commands of God. And I can preach hard and scream at you and yell at you. And every message I preach to you, I've already preached to me before I can stand behind this pulpit. But all of my preaching, all the Bible studies you set in, none of those things in themselves will make you stop complaining and murmuring. Those things within themselves will not cause you to develop a spirit of gratefulness and gratitude. It will be when you understand that Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Only through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you these few things and I'll close. There are many reasons why we need to be grateful and not murmur and complain. I read this a long time ago or heard it. I don't remember and I can't give it word for word. But it went something like this. Whatever situation that you are in that would cause you to be ungrateful will last only as long as it takes God to bring to pass his purpose in it. Okay, I'll condense that. Whatever situation you're going through right now that you're complaining about, that you're not happy with, that you're discontented with. Some of you young people, it may be because you think that you're a certain age and you should be married by now, but God hasn't brought that to pass. And so you're frustrated. You're ungrateful. Well, that will only last as long as it takes God to accomplish his purpose in your singleness. Are you all following me? In other words, if God has not brought that person into your life, you spend the rest of your life with, God has a purpose in your singleness. And when God has accomplished that purpose, then God will bring that person who you'll spend the rest of your life with. So rather than complain and gripe, we should rejoice in the fact that God has my life in his hand. We used to sing that old song, he's got the whole world in his hand. He's got your life in his hand. And so whatever situation is going on that's causing you to have a spirit of discontentment or ungratefulness, it'll only last as long as it takes God to accomplish his purpose in that. So be grateful. Did you know that God limits the intensity of your situation. He says, I'll never put more on you than you're able to bear. He told Satan concerning Job, he said, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. You can take his possessions, but you can't take his life. We have examples and we have the word of God that says that God is in control of the intensity of our difficulties. So we ought to be grateful in that and realize that it will only last as long as it takes for God to accomplish his purpose. So be grateful. God limits the length of time that you're going through right now. I think about when Peter was in jail in Acts chapter 12. That's an amazing story. I read it over and over because it's so amazing. But it was God who determined the length of time that Peter would be in jail. Because when the time was up, guess what? God sent the angel, woke Peter up, escorted him right out. So sometimes we, we complain and murmur about the time. How long, Lord? How long? How long am I going to have to have this awful job. How long am I going to have to put up with this neighbor? How long am I going to have to do this and that? The Bible tells me that God controls even the length of time 
that your situation will last. I think about Paul and Silas when they were in jail in Acts chapter 16. When the time was up, God opened the prison doors and they walked free. Why should we rejoice and stop murmuring? We need to realize that God will fight our battles for us. He'll fight every battle for you. I'll just make a reference here and not turn there, but in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, you have the story of Jehoshaphat. One of my favorite passages in Scripture, Jehoshaphat was surrounded, no way out. And in those first few verses of chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles, the Bible says that Jehoshaphat called for a fast and a big prayer meeting. But in that prayer meeting, he didn't immediately start out by saying, Lord, you, you see we're surrounded here, and so we need more men, and we need more horses and more swords and more spears. No. In his prayer, he started out by praising God. And you might say, well, Jehoshaphat was almost insulting to God. He was talking to God like God didn't know these things. But it wasn't. What he said was, God, are you not the God that delivered us out of Egypt? Now, God knew he was the God that delivered him out of Egypt. He was praising God. He said, are you not the God that fed us from day to day as we travel through that, on that journey? Are you not the God that made our clothes not to wear out all the way, all the time we were traveling? Are you not the God? Listen, Jehoshaphat didn't call a prayer meeting and then gripe and complain. He called a prayer meeting and praised God. You might say Jehoshaphat was not in his right mind. I might add this. I don't know much about his mind, but his heart was right. He didn't look at the enemy and complain. He didn't look at the, the logistics of it and complain. He saw what he saw. But then when he went to God, he said, God, thank you because you're the God who has brought us this far. And unless, unless your purpose is already completed in us, you're going to take us through this. And if you read that story, it will bless your heart. Do you know at the very end of that story, after the battle was won, that the Bible says this, that the people around realized that God fought the battle for the people of Israel. We complain because we're, we have conflict. We complain because it's like there's just a battle to fight every day with all that's going on in our world, especially as a Christian. The battle is not yours. It belongs to God. So we ought to rejoice in the fact that God, as Peter and John put it in Acts chapter 5, we ought to thank God that God counted us worthy. Worthy to be on the front lines of battle. Isn't that amazing? I mean, after all, look at us. And God chose us to be on the front lines of battle? I love what Pastor Clay says. Being a Christian is not a playground. It's a battlefield. And God chose you, Jeff, and you, Jimmy, and you, Chet, to be on the front line of battle? Man, we ought to praise God. You say, praise God, I'm on the front line of battle? No, praise God that he saw you worthy to be on the front lines of the battle. Let's all stand. Miss Kristen, if you'll make your way to the piano, please. Are you a Christian today? Are you truly a child of God? I never say, can you go back to a date on a calendar? But can you go back to a time in your life when you know that you trusted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life? Listen, not when you walked down this aisle, not when you got baptized, not when you went to a church camp, but when you individually, please listen, when you as an individual cried out to God realizing that you were lost and hell bound. And you cried out to God. He said, God, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. I repent of my sin. 
Come into my heart and be the Lord, the master of my life. If you cannot think of the time in your life when you did that, would you trust Jesus today? Would you just trust Jesus today? With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one's looking around. God's people are praying. Listen, you're a Christian right now. You pray. Pray for everybody on the pew with you. Say, God, if there's somebody sitting on the pew with me right now, if they're not saved, God, move through the power of your Holy Spirit that they might walk down that aisle and give their lives to you. As Miss Kristen plays, Christians are praying. Would you come? Would you come? He loves you. He died on a cross for you. And he wants to accomplish. He wants to accomplish something in your life. And the bottom line is that it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, none of what I've preached will make any difference. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you were to die, your home will be an eternal, eternal hell. Why not choose Jesus today? Why not choose heaven today? Would you come? Some are at the altars. Would you step out? Are you saved? Listen, I want, I want to be very personal with you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's looking around. But are you here this morning and you, there's any doubt in your mind as to whether or not you're saved? Any doubt at all? No one's looking around. Would you lift your hand? I'll know who you are. I'll not bother you. I'll not come to you. But I will pray for you. If you're not sure you're saved today, would you lift your hand? And you can put it right back down. Praise the Lord. If you, are, is there anybody else? Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved today, but I want to make sure. I want to make sure. Would you lift your hand? Praise the Lord. Listen, God is an awesome, awesome God. And he wants to save you. He wants to save you. You might say, are you talking about that baby Jesus that we hear about at Christmas time? Yes, I'm talking about baby Jesus who became the Savior of the world, who died on the cross for you. Would you come? She's going to play through the course. If you don't come, you're going to close the service. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your love for the Word of God. I want to ask Brother Jim Spurgeon to make your way. And while you're doing that, Pastor Clay will be preaching tonight, 6 o'clock. And I want to give just a little bit of a, of a, I want to salt the oats for you for a moment. He's already told me what he was, pre are you preaching what you, you didn't get there? Okay, what he's preaching now is going to be so exciting. You'll be mad if you miss it. And when he gets to the one that he and I've talked about, if you miss that one, don't murmur. But be sad that you missed it. He's preaching in 1 Samuel, and then he'll be traveling through 1 and 2 Samuel, and it is so exciting. And I can't wait to be here tonight. And you might say, well, I don't always come on Sunday nights. Come. You'll be blessed because it's the Word of God that blesses us. Um, brother, would you come and dismiss us? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have had to come together and to listen to your word. God, I pray that we wouldn't just hear your word, but we would do your word. Help us to always be joyful and not murmur and be good examples to uh, other Christians, but also be good examples to uh, people that don't know you. And just help us to always have a word to say uh, to those that, that don't know you. And uh, God, I just thank you for this season that we have to kind of concentrate on, on you and, and the birth of Jesus more than we usually do, and that the world around us does that same thing. So pray that you'd be with us as we uh, return here tonight and uh, listen to your word again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.